Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to the 15th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. We have a full house today, no apologies have been received and we'll move straight to agenda item one, which is post legislative scrutiny of the High Hedges Scotland Act 2013. The committee will take evidence from Mark MacDonald on its post legislative scrutiny of the Act. Mark MacDonald was the member in charge of the High Hedges Scotland Bill and can I welcome Mark MacDonald uh, to the committee this morning. Thanks for coming along, Mark. And uh, I think it would only be appropriate to give you the opportunity to make some opening remarks before we move to questioning. Uh, no, I think best just to go straight to questioning, convener. OK, well, my first question would have been, do you think that the Act has delivered what you thought it would uh, deliver? Has the intent been realised, uh, Mr so I think, Donald? Well, I think if we, if we track back to what the intention behind the legislation was, there was uh, clearly an issue uh, within Scotland where um, neighbour neighbor disputes uh, which centred around high hedges um, didn't have any means of resolution uh, available uh, for uh, residents who were affected and so the legislation sought to uh, create a way that those could be remedied. Um, it built on uh, some of the examples that had been seen uh, south of the border and I did go down to visit a couple of local authorities in the northeast of England to discuss how it had worked in their area. Um, and I think what's broadly happened in Scotland mirrors to an extent the, the, the situation there in that there were uh, a number of cases which essentially resolved themselves as a consequence of the legislation coming into effect because it meant people essentially changed their behaviour because they recognised that there was a, a means by which um, their neighbour could pursue uh, a high hedge complaint. Um, in those cases where um, there has not been uh, that behavioural change and people have made applications uh, where the authority has found in favour um, of the person making the, uh, making the application, um, generally speaking, and I think it was borne out by the evidence that you took uh, last week from local authority officers, there hasn't been a requirement for local authorities to go in and take action. Uh, it has tended to be that the notices have been complied with. Now, obviously, there's been a, a question around how timely some of that has been done, and I think that's something that, that may come out in further questioning. Um, there are, of course, going to be people who uh, will say that they don't feel that they've achieved resolution as a result of this, and I think they would fall broadly into two camps. The first are probably those uh, who feel that the local authorities' uh, approach uh, to how they have uh, interpreted the legislation has not been uh, in terms of the spirit uh, of the legislation. Um, and there are also those who, um, with the best will in the world, this bill was never going to be about having every single case uh, being determined on behalf of the person uh, making an appeal for a, a high hedge notice. Um, it was about ensuring that there was a means by which uh, the dispute could be resolved. That didn't mean it would always be resolved uh, in the one direction. Um, so there will undoubtedly be some people who feel that the the legislation has not worked effectively for them because it didn't look, didn't give them the result they wanted. That doesn't always mean that the legislation has not been effective. Okay, uh, Mr. McDonald, that's quite helpful. Has there been any kind of have you had time yourself as the member who was initially in charge of the bill before it became law as to whether whether or not um, all the cases that have been referred to the local authority by by constituents across the country whether or not what extent the because we know last week that the council was asserted that um it had been successful where they apply the legislation is that your feeling that constituents have got that because local authorities obviously are good at saying that they do things well but that's not necessarily the the reality of the situation is there any data you can direct us towards how that's actually quantified um, well, I would freely admit, Convener, that at the point at which the legislation was passed, it then became the responsibility of government to uh, introduce the, the relevant guidance and then to monitor uh, how the Act was uh, implemented. Um, I have not been in a position to keep uh, that level of scrutiny of the, the way the legislation has been implemented. Uh, certainly in terms of my own constituency caseload as a constituency member, I have not seen uh, individuals coming to me who have uh, found it difficult to uh, gain any resolution to their problems. Now, that may be that there are just not people in my constituency who have those uh, particular issues. Uh, I have had one or two uh, emails from individuals in other parts of Scotland, as you might expect, as the member who 
took the legislation forward and where possible I've directed them on to either their local member or to uh, their local authority where they would be best to pursue their issues but uh, I haven't got that kind of uh, data to hand but that might be something you might want to pick up next week when I think you've got the minister in front of you. Yeah, absolutely and I think that will be our intention. Thank you very much. We'll move uh, on to some further questioning now. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks. Thanks convener. Um, can you, re reading some of the debate around the time you introduced the bill, there was quite a bit of discussion about what kinds of vegetation this bill was intended to, to cover. Can you confirm that the intention of the bill was to deal with the problem of high hedges? Uh, yes, that yes. Uh, is the point. But um, the Act itself, um, and I'm sure Mr Whiteman will have read the Act, uh, sets out what it means by a high hedge yep. as well. And it wasn't intended to cover trees and forests and shelter belts? No, it was, it was designed to um, uh, deal with, um, and uh, so if I just read um, section one of the Act, um, this Act applies in relation to a hedge referred to in this Act as a high hedge, which uh, A, is formed wholly or mainly by a row of two or more trees or shrubs, uh, B, rises to a height of more than two metres above ground level, uh, and C, uh, forms a barrier to light. So if it meets those three definitions, then it would be uh, falling within the realms of the Act. Which brings me to one of the central problems that has come up um, in terms of people trying to use the Act, because Section 1 defines a high hedge, but for a hedge to be high, it needs to be a hedge in the first place. And there seems to be some confusion as to whether Section 1, 1, A, B and C are defining a high hedge, i.e. a subset of hedges, or whether it's also defining a hedge. Do you accept that for it to be a high hedge, it needs to be a hedge in the first place? Well, I think what the legislation was designed to do was to recognise that uh, the effect uh, of certain vegetation uh, beyond a certain height, so two metres uh, was the height that was specified in the legislation, uh, could uh, give effect uh, to essentially the same effect as what you might define in the uh, in, in, you know, dictionary definition uh, of a hedge. And we uh, deliberately um, stepped back from a, applying a dictionary definition of a hedge because that could have potentially excluded some of the uh, cases which we had seen which uh, were uh, entirely uh, appropriate to fall within the legislation uh, as we were defining it. But, but in, ex in excluding those, you were presumably excluding vegetation that wasn't a hedge. Is... I'm not entirely sure. Well, you I'm say you didn't following... want to define a hedge. Well, we have we but... have looked at um, the cases which existed across Scotland, um, and have uh, we came to a, a decision uh, as to what would be the most effective way to create uh, legislation that would give the best possibility of resolution to those disputes. Um, and the definition which is contained within the legislation was what uh, I felt at the time uh, was the most appropriate means uh, of enabling that. But you'll, you, you maybe have seen evidence from Aberdeen City Council which makes this very point that they have... Um, um, uh, denied applications that have come in for a high hedge notice on the basis that it wasn't in the first instance a hedge? Well, this is a question around intention versus effect, I think, uh -huh. and the legislation is about looking at the effect rather than the intention. So it may be that the intention when an individual plants, for example, the land eye in their back garden is not for them to uh, give effect to uh, a hedge or a barrier uh, to light for their neighbour, uh, but the effect of that the land eye being allowed to grow to a certain height and therefore a certain density uh, gives that effect. So it's about the effect rather than the intention at the point at which planting takes place. That's why it uh, makes clear around, uh, for example, uh, formed wholly or mainly by a row of two or more trees or shrubs you know an individual tree could potentially uh, cause difficulty for an individual but we recognized uh, that that wouldn't fall within the realms of a high hedge so are you suggesting that when Aberdeen City Council reject applications that meet these criteria but that are not hedges in their view uh, they're, they're wrong to do that I think that uh, councils should have due regard to what is defined in the legislation uh, in terms of what constitutes a high hedge, and that would have been my expectation when the legislation was passed. But the problem seems to be that what's contained in the legislation is merely, solely a, def a definition of a high hedge. It's not a definition of a hedge, and 
this matters because speaking to our borough culturists and people, they will say there's a distinct difference between a hedge and a shelter belt or a row of trees. So do, do you recognise that there might be some merit in defining a hedge before we then get on to define what is a high hedge? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out, Convener, if I'm uh, disappointed or uh, pleased that Mr Whiteman was not here when we were discussing this <laughs> bill uh, in, its, uh, in its initial stages. But uh, I take on board the point you make, um, and I think it would certainly be something to, to have uh, consideration to. Of course, uh, attempting to do what Mr Whiteman suggests may uh, very well kick open a, a rather large can of worms in terms of the cases which may or may not then uh, be uh, included or excluded as a consequence of, of doing what you suggest but it, it may be something that the government would want to consider and I'm sure the Minister would be interested to discuss that next week Okay, just finally then so do you, do you agree with Aberdeen City Council's evidence where they say they're declining to deal with an application because it is not in the first instance a hedge or do you think that is inappropriate to do that or do you think that's within the bounds of flexibility that you intended? I think um, it's difficult for me to give you a definitive response to that, Mr Whiteman, because obviously I'm not looking at each, each individual case. So um, I wouldn't want to put a blanket yes or no uh, over, um, over, over that situation. But what I would hope uh, is that local authorities were not uh, seeking to um, exclude applications on the basis of their own determinations rather than the determinations that are set out for them in legislation. Okay, thanks. Can I just check, Mr MacDonald, in terms of what the bill was intended to do, does it actually matter whether it's a hedge or not? Is, is the issue not as long as it meets the conditions set out uh, that you read out at the start of, of this evidence session? We need a botanist or whoever to, to determine the, what kind of plant life or shrubbery is. That's kind of irrelevant, would you not agree? And that whatever changes are made to the, uh, to the legislation or guidance that should be clear. I mean, I, I, I'm minded that actually by having a clearer definition of a hedge, that could be restrictive rather than inclusive as well. So we have to be careful there's not an unintended consequence. Would you like to make sure that as long as it meets the conditions set out on the face of the bill that you pass to the member in charge of that, irrespective of what plant life it is or is not, should be completely irrelevant? And if it's impacting on a quality of life on the conditions set out on the face of the bill, there should be enforcement powers by local authorities. Uh, yeah, well, essentially, uh, convener, the legislation was um, written in such a way as to provide uh, a definition of what constituted a high hedge. But the um, the purpose of the legislation was not to uh, essentially define a hedge within law. It was to create a means by which neighbour disputes that related to high hedges. Uh, could be resolved. That was the purpose behind the legislation. But uh, we set out that definition uh, at section one, uh, and that was the definition that should be followed. I want to tease out is whether you think that uh, local authorities should be inclusive and open-minded in relation to how they interpret what is or isn't a high hedge, or whether they should be restrictive. Uh, because right now, some of the evidence we've had is they appear to be highly restrictive. Uh, rather than inclusive and given the, if there's any, any area of doubt, then re restrictive practices apply rather than being open-minded to dealing with what is the neighbourhood disputes. Where would you sit in relation to that? Well, as I say, if it, if, if, so, if there are a row of two or more trees or shrubs, it rises to a height of more than two metres above ground level and it forms a barrier to light, by the law, it constitutes a high hedge. That's what the legislation says. Irrespe so, irrespective so, of whether it's a hedge. Well, so yeah. So then, local authorities have to make a determination uh, as to the effect of um, the uh, vegetation um, in order to determine whether a high hedge notice should be applied. Um, I think other members want to come in just to pursue this a little, little, little further. Um, Elaine Smith. Thanks, convener. But part of the problem. Oh, sorry, can I say thanks for joining us this morning to be trying tease some of this out. Um, I think part of the problem, and I just heard Andy Whiteman saying it to my right as well, is that it actually says the Act applies in relation to a hedge which, and that then takes us back to local authorities perhaps saying, well, we don't know if this is a hedge or not, and therefore we can't deem it to be a high hedge. Can I ask, first of all, 
I think if I recall rightly, there were some amendments at the time trying to define a hedge. And so, could you just take us through again what your understanding was of these words that say the Act applies in relation to a hedge? Which, how, how would one define that word? Well, and that's, you know, that, that, that is some of the difficulty into which um, we have entered, although it, uh, it does say in brackets after in relation to a hedge referred to in this Act as a high hedge. So we're speaking about specifically uh, the high hedges uh, that we were seeing. Um, and uh, what, we would, what we didn't want to do was to get to a situation where we were defining individual species. Because if you start to define individual species, you then create uh, loopholes which individuals can exploit. So, for example, uh, we had a discussion around the formation of the bill where it was stated that if you had, uh, you know, Leylandi planted, but with, uh, for example, another uh, species planted in between, then potentially, uh, although the effect could be created, you would potentially exclude that from consideration uh, if you defined the specific species which could be considered. Uh, indeed, uh, as I recall, uh, we accepted an amendment from Anne McTaggart at stage three, which took out, I believe, the definition as including evergreen trees uh, in the legislation, um, which was the initial uh, consideration that we were giving uh, so that it would also include deciduous because we recognised that deciduous uh, could also form uh, a barrier to light. Um, so that was uh, part of the consideration that we took forward. So we were trying not to be overly prescriptive uh, on the basis that we wanted to ensure that the widest number of cases could have consideration. Um, however, it may be that as a consequence of that, uh, local authorities have chosen to use that broader flexibility in the opposite direction to enable them to rule things out. So um, I am freely admit that that may have been a, an unintended consequence. I think, uh, if I may convene, you know, we did hear from a witness that, uh, I think it was Leylandi, a row of Leylandi, which was extremely high and had been planted with the intention of it being a hedge and the people in the house whose light was being blocked out by it had got that in writing from the person who planted it and still the local authority didn't deem it to be a high hedge. So, uh, and whether or not that relates back to the problem of whether they deemed it to be a hedge in the first place, I think is something that the committee is going to have to further explore. But I do know that some of my colleagues want to come in on the issue as well. I know that uh, Mr Simpson wants to add to that, plus takes on to another line of questioning as well. Uh, Graham Simpson. Yeah, um, I just want to um, de describe a situation uh, to you and uh, ask you um, if you think it's co covered by the Act. Um, so I, I live in East Kilbride. Um, I used to be a, a councillor there. Um, the area that I live in, um, there, there are large um, areas of that uh, which were planted by the original developers, um, trees and, and, and shrubs, but not hedges. Uh, they've subsequently uh, uh, grown up to form the very sort of barriers uh, that you describe, backing onto people's gardens. Uh, but we have a council there who um, have a policy of not cutting down healthy trees. But we have a, a, a number of households who are badly affected by loss of light. Do you think um, that sort of situation um, would be covered by the Act? I think there's a difficulty here for me, convener, in that I don't want to be seen to be um, attempting to adjudicate on individual cases. Um, I think um, if I can come back to the point though that Mr Simpson raises about the uh, policy of not cutting down uh, healthy trees, uh, I'm trying to find the piece within the legislation, but if I remember correctly, the, the legislation uh, merely asks uh, authorities to have consideration to issues such as historical or cultural significance uh, and also to have consideration to tree preservation orders. I don't think it makes any uh, stipulation around whether or not the the tree is healthy or otherwise uh, in terms of action that should could or should be taken. Um, I would I would I would hesitate to try and adjudicate on that particular case um, because as I say I'm not familiar with it and um, I think don't think it would be my position to do so. Really describing a situation in general where um, things have been planted, they've grown up uh, and they've, they've then formed what uh, any sensible person would describe as a barrier. 
Um, but but they're not. They're clearly not hedges. Hmm. Uh, I think. Um, I mean, we've heard ev evidence where. Uh, I'm sorry, convener. I'm being distracted uh, by. Apologies for yeah. that. Was, I, sorry, well, well, my apologies to Mr. Simpson because I was I was trying to let the conversation go as long as possible without so asking to stop so talking. So that should a note to all members so not to speak out of courtesy to witnesses and other members, Mr. Simpson. Thanks, thank, thanks convener. Right. Um, so. So we have things that are planted. They're, they're grown up. They're not hedges to start with. They then form a barrier. Um, too light. Is, was it the intention of your act to deal with that situation? So the, the, the question is around whether there's a right for that to be considered under the act um, versus whether there's a right for a decision because the decision ultimately would come down to uh, the adjudication of the individual uh, local authority officer. Um, but as I say, if it meets the criteria as set out in the legislation, then there is a duty to consider. That doesn't mean there's a duty to find in favour, but it mm. does mean that it should be considered if it meets those criteria. Do you think councils are, are falling back, <coughs> are falling back on the word hedge? I think so. Yes. Um, and I think you know um, there there is good reason why you know why defining a hedge in legislation um, could have proven a difficult issue, um, particularly if one was to only use. For example, the Oxford English Dictionary definition of a hedge, um, but it's you know if the if the committee is so minded to consider whether that would be something they would want to see happen or indeed to have a go, um, then that's something they can they can have a think about. Yeah. So if we if we called it something else, you know, like the High Foliage Bill or, or, or something like that, then uh, councils couldn't then say, well, it's not a hedge. Well, potentially. I don't think we should continue this conversation further unless we allow <laughs> Mr Whiteman in to discuss the definitions, which we're not going to do just now, Mr Whiteman. Do you want to follow up on any of that, Mr Simpson? That's right. Okay, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. We had some aspects about wildlife and we had uh, talk about green space uh, when we were taking some evidence. Can I ask about the potential impact on both wildlife and green space? Uh, when we were when you were taking forward the legislation uh, and defining what was part of the act, yeah. So we had discussions um, in relation to that with a number of organisations um, who uh, offered advice uh, in terms of what the potential impact could be on, for example, nesting areas and other habitats. Um, and again, you know, that that will obviously have to form a consideration in any determination. So if, um, for example, I think one of the the, the cases I've been aware of is that an order has been passed, but it can only be given effect outside of the nesting season. So, um, you know, that, that has to form part of the consideration for any, any decision that is made. And, and the same about the, the whole aspect of green space, uh, because when, when, when many of the, these developments are, are, when the houses are built, uh, they create some shrubbery and create green space, which then in turn becomes a a massive forest or uh, uh, creates a massive imp implication for some of the individuals who are living in the vicinity of them. Uh, I think I think there are two, well, I say two, there are probably more than two, but I think, you know, there are, there are a number of different ways in which problems arise. Uh, one is people simply planting things like they land eye because they know that they will grow quickly and therefore can block, uh, block their neighbours. Uh, you know, in, in what they maybe think is a, a, an attempt to gain privacy, but also can be done in a way to uh, give effect to or continue a dispute with their neighbours. Uh, in other cases, it's simply that uh, people have uh, lost or do not have the ability to maintain their uh, vegetation properly. And as a consequence, it gets out of hand and out of control. Um, so there are, there are a number of ways in which um, this can take effect, and the, the, the situation you describe is, uh, is, is one such circumstance. And then when, 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 when we took some more evidence, the whole appeal process then came into that because of what was being found by individuals who are having to cope with the situation. Do you think the appeal process is robust enough uh, from what you wanted to try and have within the Act? Because it has then, interpretation uh, has been open to... Uh, how, how that's managed, and then the councils have used that uh, when when individuals have not found that they they say well it's not a hedge, uh, and then the, the individuals themselves find that the uh, 
the whole appeal process seems to uh, not progress in the way they expected it to progress, uh, and the council seemed to have an upper hand in the whole process. Well, I'm not, as I say, because I've not had people come to me in relation to appeals, so I'm not entirely clear on how effective or otherwise it has been for individuals. Undoubtedly, you know, it is the nature of any uh, legislation, and in particular any legislation which deals with dispute resolution, that you will find aggrieved parties uh, throughout uh, the country who have attempted to use this legislation to resolve a dispute but have not been able to do so. Um, I think um, undoubtedly there, there may be circumstances where people feel the appeals process has not worked in the way that they would have intended it to. I guess that's something the committee would need to come to a judgment on. Thank you, Kenyon. Okay. Um, can I maybe ask another question to mop up there, um, just in terms of the fees base around uh, whether the application of fees has been implemented uh, as expected, whether a means-tested approach to fees, I think they vary, or they can vary across the country and be prohibitive, um, and whether a standard fee across each local authority area would make the process more accessible. So if you wish to appeal, obviously there's a... There's a cost to that, and that cost varies across the country. Can that be prohibitive? Is there a better way of doing this? So um, the fees issue was one which uh, I seem to remember a, a degree of discussion about at the Finance Committee when Mr Gibson was in the chair. Um, I'm reliving my past somewhat today. Um, but I, I, I um, so the evidence that we took um, suggested that, for example, south of the border, the fees system varied quite substantially. Um, what I sought to do was firstly to ensure that local authorities had the opportunity to set their fees um, because, you know, I didn't believe that a simple centralised fee system was the right way to go. I chose not to put a cap in uh, because the evidence from Wales was that if you put a cap on the fees, everybody just goes to the cap and charges the, the maximum amount. And what I sought to try and do based on my experience uh, of what, what at the time was the House of Multiple Occupation uh, licensing approach was to build in a mechanism whereby the fee could only be charged at a rate that would cover the administrative costs of dealing with the application. So essentially you couldn't just arbitrarily set a fee, you had to demonstrate um, that that fee uh, related to the administrative uh, costs. Now I know there are some local authorities who have suggested that they are uh, undercharging on that basis. Uh, there are some people who would suggest that local authorities are overcharging on that basis. Um, the other thing which I set out at the time was that my expectation would be that if, uh, if I was a local councillor and people were coming and chapping on my door and telling me that they couldn't access this because of the fees that were being charged, they were being they were prohibitive. They weren't being uh, done in such a way that was fair to people. Uh, I would expect local councillors to have due regard to that when it comes to making their decisions at a committee around what the fees should be and how they should be structured. Um, but um, you know uh, that was instinctively why I went in that direction rather than going in the direction of saying at a national level this is the fee that will be charged in all parts of Scotland. Mr. Whiteman, want to follow up on some of that, and Mr. Gibson. Yes, as well. you, you mentioned earlier that if a if a if a hedge meets the definition of the act, it, it, the, the council's got a duty to consider it. Um, but the, the the act appears to me to um, uh, allow people to make an application with an accompanying fee, and in some instances, the application's been made, the fee's been paid, and the local authorities come back and said, "Well, this doesn't qualify under the act." It seems in those circumstances a bit unfair to pay the fee in the first place. Is that, is that your understanding of how the fee structure works? It's certainly been one of the so, complaints that we've heard. So, uh, Section 4, Subsection 4. A fee paid to an authority may be refunded by it in such circumstances and to such extent as it may determine. Um, I would be surprised if in the circumstances you're describing the fee was not also refunded because um, if, if the application is being dismissed before any assessment... Uh, has been undertaken, then they should see the fee coming back. But the fee is there to enable a determination to be made, um, not necessarily for a positive outcome for the individual who's making the application. No, I, I understand that. And, and, and a, a certain amount of work has to be done to determine whether, in fact, this is a legitimate application. But in those instances where they're being knocked back very quickly on the basis that this is not, in their view, a, a hedge, as opposed to a full determination, which may take some time, um, 
one or two aggrieved parties have suggested or appear to be suggesting that that's a bit unfair that they pay the full fee when in fact they should never have and, and there is a there is a in the act also it's, it, it makes clear that there should be some preliminary investigations as well um, but the question is should there be some minimum fee for ensuring that it is a valid application in the first instance and then you pay the full fee for the determination I think that would be a potentially sensible suggestion um, but uh, obviously it would depend on how that was then applied at a local level of course mm. if that was the if the committee was of the view that it should continue to be set at a local level it would then be for local authorities to determine what that initial fee would be but um, I don't think that's an unreasonable approach to suggest Okay, okay Mr Gibson Yes, it's just on the same issue of fees, actually. I mean, a number of uh, applicants have expressed their uh, concern that they have to pay this application, even if, in fact, it's found against the hedge grower. And it was just to see whether or not you felt that if an application is, in fact, found against a hedge grower, then the hedge grower should actually <coughs> uh, pay the fee. Because, uh, quite clearly, if that individual had cut the hedge in the first place, then <coughs> someone else wouldn't have had to pay several hundred pounds to take this case forward. And it, it does seem it, it, would, it would coincide with the polluter pays kind of principle. I think <coughs> this came up, I think, during the discussion at the time, and I think it was Gavin Brown at the time on the Finance Committee and then Margaret Mitchell at Local Government Committee who pursued this. And my thinking at the time was, uh, was along the lines of, firstly, um, I felt that um, the if the means of well if the if the if the legislation was in place to help to resolve neighbourhood disputes, um, and you then were to so you then had an application made, uh, an order is uh, an order is granted, uh, the owner of the hedge complies with that order, uh, and then is told right thanks for complying with that order you've now got to pay your neighbour five hundred pounds or four hundred pounds, my thought at the time was that that might not be the best means by which to ensure that neighbourhood disputes are completely resolved. The second part of that is if the individual said, well, no, I'm not going to pay that, um, then the local authority might find themselves in a situation of essentially expending disproportionate sums of money to recoup, you know, a few hundred pounds. And so there was a question there as to whether that would you know wh whether applying it in that way would mean that you might have local authorities having to go chasing what are relatively small sums of money for the authority granted not for the person who's paid the fee i take that on board entirely uh, but also whether um the you know the fee in itself is a means by which uh, resolution can be give can, can, can take effect to the dispute that was uh, underway. So um, that was the determination I took. Um, I understand, I think Northern Ireland were looking at a fee repayment uh, approach where they followed exactly the, the system that you suggested. I've not seen whether that's had any uh, difficulties since their law came into effect, but the committee might want to look at that further. Yeah, well, they wouldn't pay the neighbour, obviously. They would pay it to the, back to the, the council, and the council would refund the neighbour. I would, I would think that would be the mechanism. I just think it would be... I just think it, a, a lot of people really feel quite um, hard done to that in order to have, you know, to get rid of hedges that block their light, they've got to actually pay several hundred pounds, and not all of them feel they can really afford it. I mean, certainly in the constituents who came to me tend to, to almost always be elderly retired people are not all particularly well healed so I, I, and, and we do have evidence that one or two people have been uh, you know put off by the application process because of the fee now I, I do accept what you say that there has to be a fee so that councils are not out of pocket themselves and so you don't get you know just uh, you know random applications uh, where uh, which would choke up the system but I think if something if someone you know if, if you if someone's found against you then you know, it's up to you to make restitution. I would have thought. I don't see that the person who effectively has been um, in the right throughout throughout this process should effectively be out of pocket because of it. it's a stressful enough situation. And if it had been resolved without action through an application, then the person who ultimately had to cut down their hedge uh, wouldn't be out of pocket uh, in that regard. So I, I, I do think, in light of experience of the act, that's something that should certainly be changed. Yeah, and again. 
just at section four of the legislation, subsection two, an authority may fix different fees for different applications or types of application. So there's nothing in this legislation that prevents or precludes authorities from introducing a scheme, for example, for the type of individuals that Mr. Gibson refers to of um, people on low incomes or people who are retired who don't necessarily have the means by which to pay uh, a lump sum up front to either pay that over the course of a year in instalments or to pay a reduced fee based on their income. So the opportunity, the ability for authorities to do that is there. There's nothing in the legislation that prohibits or excludes them from doing that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably conflated two issues. One is the cost in itself, and I think South Ayrshire is the only local authority that does have kind of means testing and a sliding scale of application costs. But the second thing is, you know, um, just the, the, the natural justice of being out of pocket when the, when um, a decision has been found against um, the person you've had to take the application out against. Because um, people obviously will it'll be a very stressful situation, I think, no doubt for both parties, but I, 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 it's just a natural justice issue, I, I think, in that regard. Sure. I, 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 I take on board the point, and I think we rehearsed that during the, the debates at stage one, two, and three in the last session as well. Um, but I think... Um, my view was that, um, and, and I take on board the point that obviously you would pay the fee to the council who would then reimburse, but people would have an understanding of where that money was going in the grand scheme of things and may have the, the side effect of creating further animosity between neighbours, but I take on board the point. Can I ask a question on just one fi or final question? Is it on the same It's not on the same area. theme. We'll, we'll come back to you then, okay, that's uh, fine. Jenny Gorath. Thank you, Convener. Um, from previous sessions, we've heard from um, people all across the country who have gone through the process in terms of getting in touch with the local authority, uh, trying to go through the high hedge process, and before they get to it, the notice being served, uh, their neighbour or whoever it is uh, has cut down every second tree. Um, do you have any view on how we can safeguard against people trying to get around the legislation like that? Ooh, um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, it it would well. It would disappoint me if that was happening across the country. Um, but I think um, in those in those circumstances, I think that uh, the you know there is the potential, I suppose, to look at the historic position in relation to the le to what was there um, and whether or not there is the likelihood of um, the situation continuing uh, to be exacerbated by the individuals. I think um, the, the practice, from what we've heard, certainly is pretty commonplace. And, and when we heard from local authorities, um, they kind of washed their hands of it and said, well, if every second tree's been cut down, it's not a hedge. So there was kind of a, a lack of, uh, I suppose, taking responsibility for it. And it feels, uh, to me, certainly, that it's a, bit of, it's a bit toothless in terms of implementing. Local authorities say they can't do anything with it. I don't know if they're waiting for you know, action from government on this, but... There is a bit of a disconnect between the intention of the legislation and folk who are deliberately going out to try and get around this legislation. Yeah, and you know th that will always happen with legislation, unfortunately, where there are you know individuals who are so minded to uh, try and circumvent the law. Um, I guess the question would be whether or not the the committee feels that a change um, to guidance or um, to the wider definition would help those individuals. Of course, the difficulty there is, is that if you were to broaden out the definition, you might then start to, you know, get into difficulties in other areas as well. So, um, you know, um, unfortunately, I'm not sure we can always protect against uh, those individuals who wish to be uh, vindictive in their approach. And just one more question about uh, the legislation. Um, what happens, or how was the legislation rather intended to deal with um, new houses when they're built and there is already a high hedge existing? I mean, to be fair to the hedge, it was there first. So, you know, how do we deal with that? Yeah. Well, yes, always keen to be fair to the hedge. Um, but um, I, I think, if, if I remember rightly, um, so the whole purpose of the legislation was that you had to you know, it wasn't just a case that you move into your house and there's a hedge next door and you say, right, that's it, I'm applying for a high hedge notice. You have to demonstrate um, that you have gone to some extent to try and resolve this in an amicable fashion with your neighbour. Um, so I would expect that if somebody moves into a property, there's a hedge next door uh, as a consequence of their house being built next to it and they say, well, that's causing me a bit of a problem. The first step should be to go around and chap on the door and say, look, is there any chance you could maybe trim that hedge and, you know, help, uh, you know, create a, a, a better 
situation for me. Um, and then if there is no uh, amicable resolution to this, then that would be at the point at which an application would be made. So it wouldn't be simply the case that you would move in and say, I'm going to get rid of that hedge by putting in a high hedge notice. You would have to demonstrate that you'd uh, tried to come to some amicable agreement with the individual who owned the hedge in the first place. Thank you. Can I just mop up on a little bit of uh, Jenny Gross questioning there in terms of Jenny's initial point in relation to um, someone goes through the process of trying to get a high hedge notice because of the detriment that, that they're suffering under under the terms of the Act, and somewhere down the line before that high hedge notice is issued or enforcement action is considered, the hedge is pruned or trimmed in the way that Jenny Gorith was outlining. It's been made the point's been made to this committee that the enforcement should be against the original uh, hedge at the point where the application was made and a determination should be based on what the hedge looked like at that point of application and if the determination is the hedge should be removed or cut completely or trimmed to a certain extent, that should be the enforcement action rather than retrospective mitigation action taken by the person trying to protect their hedge uh, just to game the system in a way. Could legislation or guidance be changed so that local authorities have to rule based at the point where the application went in from the plaintiff? Because that would help a lot of people that we've heard from. Well, I think I think the difficulty there, convener, would be that the um, the only evidence you would have would be probably photographs, um, and it wouldn't be possible for the local authority to make a firm determination on, for example, the height. Now, you know, in some of these things, it will be very obvious that it's taller than two meters, uh, but you know, you always run the risk of opening yourself up to challenge uh, if you make your determination based on anything other than an act, you know, a full uh, consideration of the application. So, um, th I could see difficulties for local authorities in those circumstances. Okay, so you see difficulties, but do you think, in terms of natural justice, Mr. McDonald, it would be a good and positive thing to do? if we can make the guidance of the legislation point in that direction. So I accept there'd have to be account taken for borderline cases, but the first thing that a local authority did once the application fee has been made is to come out and just assess, do a basic assessment of the situation, photographs, video footage, whatever, and it gets banked away for processing at a later date. It could become yeah. fairly obvious. I th I, well, sorry, I, w I wasn't... I wasn't responding on the basis that an initial determination would have, or an initial, initial assessment would have been undertaken. I think in those circumstances, if a local authority officer has been out and examined um, and then goes away to make their determination, and in the intervening period, as you say, uh, some action is taken, well, they should still consider issuing a notice um, because the notice may, re may require more action to be taken than has been taken in the intervening period. Um, so that that would be for the local, but that would be for the local authorities to determine. Just final question in relation to this. Just as I was asking that question, I assume that there could be a situation where the the applicant for a hedge notice is dissatisfied, um, and they could seek to appeal that determination. But they could be told, look, this th this is a different structure now. You have to apply a second time for a high hedge notice. This is a different beast we're looking at now. Um, is there any is there anything in terms of the regulations you're aware of that could preclude local authorities from charging fees twice in such circumstances? Um, I'm I'm not aware. No, well, I don't think there's a kind of a you can only apply once and that's it. But um, in the circum so in general terms, um, you you know, you could potentially apply again in future if, for example, the situation developed beyond that which had originally been assessed by the local authority but in the circumstances that you've described i'm not sure there's anything that would automatically prevent that from happening okay okay we'll move on um Elaine Smith. thanks convener um just following on as well from something jenny go ruth was exploring with you mr mcdonald's the the issue in the act about reasonable enjoyment wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit more about what what was meant by that originally and, and what might be included well <laughs> I think I think it's about you know uh, looking at how um, 
the barrier to light that is created affects an individual's ability to enjoy their property. So whether that's you know the ability for them to uh, use their garden uh, or for the ability um, for them to receive light into certain rooms in their house, um, those are the, the kind of determinations that we were thinking about in relation to that. I mean, I've met with people during the course of the legislation who had to have the light on in one room in the house 24 hours, a, well, not 24 hours a day, but all through the day because they couldn't get any natural light into the building. So uh, those were the kind of considerations that we were thinking about there. And do you think that should be sort of apparent then to any officer who was making a judgment on that? I would, I would expect that these kind of things would be fairly obvious, although there will, there will obviously be degrees to which they apply. Thanks very much. Um, you spoke at the beginning when you answered the convener's first question about maybe coming back to some practicalities. Could I just ask if you have any view on the suggestion that there should be a, a time limit set from the application of the hedge notice to the decision of the council, obviously bearing in mind the issue that was raised earlier about wildlife? Yeah, I think there were some timescales laid out in legislation, but one of the ones which we didn't set at the time was the time it takes from the individual applying to the authority to the authority making a determination. And uh, I'm aware of people who have mentioned the length of time that it takes to get a decision from the local authority and uh, you know there may be some merit in looking at that Thanks. and another issue that has come up uh, in our exploration of this is whether or not there sh perhaps should be fixed penalty notices for failing to comply with a high hedge notice do you think that's something that might be worth considering so the um the decision that we took was that um the if you didn't comply with a high hedge notice, the local authority was um, empowered to come in, do the work, and then recover their costs, which um, would probably be much more than it would cost the individual to pay a fixed penalty notice. So um, I'm not sure that adding a fixed penalty notice onto the top of what would be the cost of the work that the local authority undertakes would necessarily act as any more of a deterrent than that, but... Um, if I could explore it slightly further, I mean, I think maybe part of the problem with that is there might be a bit of um, hesitation on the authority to go and do the work, perhaps because uh, obviously you're taking steps to go into someone else's property, the, the repercussions that might come from that. So they might be a bit reticent around that, whereas perhaps a fixed penalty notice could focus the mind of the owner of the high hedge into getting the work done themselves? I mean, it, it could, but it also potentially elongates the process for the person who has made the application to get the resolution that they've sought. So, um, because obviously any fixed penalty notice has a period of time in which the individual can pay it. If they then choose not to pay it, the local authority would then have to chase them up on it um, and you potentially get into a slightly more protracted process before then the local authority eventually goes in uh, and undertakes that work. So um, I, uh, instinctively my view at the time was that the best way to ensure compliance was to say if you don't comply with this we'll do the work and you'll pay for us to have done the work, which might cost you more than it would cost you to actually get it fixed yourself. So um, that was my view at the time, and I don't think I would say that my view has shifted in relation to that. I think it should just be reasonably simple that the local authority, having issued a high hedge notice, having done all of the work, having deemed it a hedge and a high hedge, then should be able to just go in and take down the hedge to a reasonable level and give the bill to the owner of the hedge? Uh, yeah, and local authorities obviously have a number of different ways in which they are able to uh, you know, get payment from individuals for the works that they undertake. So, um, But I think that that would, you know, you give people a reasonable length of time to comply with the order. If they don't comply with the order, the authority then has uh, the power to intervene uh, and recoup its costs. Do you think overall maybe guidance needs to be more robust to authorities? Uh, in terms of the overall? I, and I suppose in terms of some of the issues we've been discussing with you today about the original intention of the Act, how it's put in place, how well, local authorities yeah. are interpreting parts of it. I think, that, I think there's a question as to whether authorities are complying with the spirit of the legislation as it was intended and perhaps um, guidance could be looked at as to whether it could be tightened up to um, make that... Uh, more likely. Convener. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Yeah, thank you, convener. I mean, that leads me on to the bit I was going to ask, which was about flexibility. I mean, you you, you, you talked about, um, you know, in the definition at the start about wholly or mainly you read out from legislation, but the interpretation from the local authority representatives we had last week seemed to be very strict and erring on the side of caution. And indeed, they all made the argument that although all the witnesses we had before that in terms of members of the public wanted the uh, act to be strengthened, so to speak, to eliminate some of the, the kind of avoidance issues that Jenny touched on. The council seemed to take the opposite approach, which was to define a hedge even more narrowly, which I don't think would uh, would impress uh, many members of the public who brought that forward. So in terms of spirit of the legislation, do you feel that the local authorities are working within that spirit, or do you think they're maybe uh, being a bit uh, too cautious in terms of how they're interpreting the legislation? I suspect, as with most things where um, we look at things across all the local authorities in Scotland, there'll be a kind of Heinz Varieties approach and that, you know, there will be some who undoubtedly are taking uh, a positive approach in relation to this and there will probably be others who uh, are taking an approach which is perhaps less uh, in keeping with the spirit of the legislation. That's, that's you know, that, that, that I suspect will be what you would find. Um, I think that um, we then need to consider whether or not um, the best way to achieve uh, a sort of parity of approach is through the guidance that comes with the legislation or whether um, some of that can be driven at a local level, of course, because ultimately um, all of these officers who sit before you from local authorities are ultimately answerable to the committees of the council in terms of the decisions that they take. Well, obviously, I mean, the legislation's uh, been out now for some years, and uh, we've had a lot of evidence um, uh, with regard to how the legislation is or allegedly is not working. How do you feel the legislation can be improved, either directly uh, or through guidance? How do you, how, how, given what you've heard, how would you, if you could effectively um, go back in time and, 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 and redo this. Is there any particular glitches you feel should be addressed or are you more or less content with, with it, um, with the legislation? How would you make it better? Gosh, I have to be very careful here, of course, that I don't, because uh, uh, obviously it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it's now the responsibility of the, the local government ah, and planning cool. minister. And, well, well, you know, you uh, make for an... It would no, make it's for. Not, it's not under your portfolio, Mr. It's not under my portfolio. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Child, childcare in early years does not cover high child hedges. Childcare early years and hedges. We I understood was, your I was distraught to learn when I took on my portfolio. Um, it would certainly make for some interesting conversations in the car back up to Aberdeen with Mr. Stewart. But um, I, I think, you know, broadly speaking, I think that what we have seen is the majority of cases uh, have either resolved themselves or been resolved, and what we're left with. Uh, as was the case uh, south of the border, are those more intractable cases where you're dealing with potentially long-standing disputes, uh, individuals who uh, are, as Jenny Gilruth has highlighted, exploiting opportunities to, um, you know, essentially circumvent the effect of the legislation. So uh, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm not sure that it is possible to build... A legislation that will, in, well, I, I don't think it is possible to build legislation that will enable everybody who applies for a high hedge notice to uh, achieve a satisfactory outcome for themselves. That was never the intention of the legislation in the first place. I recognised at the outset that, you know, this was about uh, providing a determination on a neighbourhood dispute. It wasn't about coming down 100% on one particular side of those neighbourhood disputes. I think the question then is about whether or not the way in which the legislation has been interpreted at a local level uh, enables people to have confidence in the decisions that are made rather than, you know, there's a difference between being uh, being unhappy with a decision that is made but having confidence that the decision has been made using the legislation in the appropriate way. Um, and I think that there then is a question around whether that is happening in all local authority areas. And the question that I think the committee would then have to reflect on is if it's happening in some places but not in others, what's the difference here? Is it about the approach that individual officers are taking and is guidance the best way to then, you know, get them to, to take a different approach? Uh, or is it about perhaps local councils uh, when they come to make their determinations around things like fees and the process um, having a more robust approach 
to ensure that they uh, are taking things forward in the spirit of the Act as it was intended. So um, I think I've kind of not answered your question, Mr Gibson, question, um, as you question, may have noticed. But, but, I, think, duck and dive, but so. I think, I think, you know, I, I, I think those are, well, those are, those are the questions which, you know, had I been wise after the, after the event sure. at the time, I might have given a bit more consideration to when putting the legislation together. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, Mr. McDonald, you've perhaps um, answered what the final question was going to be, which was, is there anything else you would like to put <coughs> on the record here this morning as we continue with our post-legislative scrutiny of the the act where you were uh, the member taking it through the Parliament? So I'll make that offer open to you just now, if there's anything. O only my gratitude to the committee for allowing me to have this jaunt down memory lane, convener. Well, you know, it, it doesn't end there. Uh, I, think Mr. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I think whatever we decide to recommend as a committee, we're keen to hear from you again further oh, in, well. in relation to that. So I will look forward uh, to it. And we're also keen to hear more about that car journey with uh, Kevin Stewart, the Minister for Local Government. Sure, he'll tell you all about again. it next week. Well, that was my link to next week's evidence <laughs> session where we'll indeed have the Minister before us to, who does have a responsibility for making sure that this Act is working as it as it should be so we'll hear from him next week so can i thank you uh, for your time this morning mr mcdonald and can we suspend briefly before we move to the next agenda item thank you
Okay, uh, welcome back. We now move to agenda item two, which is post legislative scrutiny of the Disabled Persons Parking Places Scotland Act 2009. And the committee will take evidence from a, a private car park operator and a supermarket on its post legislative scrutiny of the Act. So, can I welcome this morning Tony McElroy, Head of Devolved Government Relations and Communications, Tesco PLC. Thank you, Mr. McElroy, for coming along. And Duncan Bowens, Managing Director of NCP. Thank you, Mr. Bowens, for, for coming along. Uh, and we'll move straight to questions, if that, that's OK with, with you. And we'll go to Graeme Simpson. Thanks, Convener. Um, thanks very much for coming. Um, so you're both from uh, kind of different sectors. Um, so perhaps I can ask the same question of both of you to start off with. Um, and it's this. Do you monitor in your car parks the misuse of disabled um, spaces? Uh, and if so, how widespread is that problem? in your car parks? Um, if you'd like me to go first. Um, so to get into context, we, we have 15 car parks, about 5,000 spaces in Scotland. Um, and we do monitor and we do enforce disabled bay um, abuse. Uh, and on average, over the last two years, 4% of all penalty charge notices issued, around 900, are for disabled bay abuse. Um, that compares to sort of 2% across the rest of the UK. Um, and we monitor all of those, and these are purely the ones in these numbers are for the abuse, not for the non-payment. So we track all the data and the records going back for three or four years now. So yes, we do. Um, yeah, similarly, so um, I suppose for, for a bit of context, in, in over 200 Tesco stores spanning all of Scotland from Highlands and Islands through to um, exceptionally urban locations, Princess Street, Sockeyall Street and so forth, um, we cumulative, uh, cumulatively have about 39,000 um, uh, parking spaces, uh, parking bays in, in Scotland, of which about 2,100 um, are, uh, are, are disabled uh, bays. So last year, um, in the last financial year, we issued about 500 um, uh, fines for disabled parking bay abuse in our stores in Scotland. Um, and that's monitored through, currently monitored through a mixture of fixed cameras and um, and marshals, um, uh, albeit that's that um, marshal uh, marshalling approach is one that we as a business are moving away from um, as the, uh, the the dawn of new technology um, enables us to um, offer a store by store um, opportunity for our colleagues to enforce. Uh, parking, so every single store would um, uh, would would be able to enforce disabled parking bays, harnessing the power of technology. We can um, empower our colleagues to be um, uh, equipped in order to monitor disabled parking bays, rather than historically where we would have taken a, um, a, a I suppose a, um, a, 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 an approach that was led by an intelligence-led approach, I suppose. So where there was customer complaints or, or colleague feedback um, about abuse, then we would put in marshals. Actually, the step change in technology means that every store will now be empowered to monitor the disabled base that they've got through the through the technology. Okay. Um, can I ask you, Mr. B Bowens? Um I, I guess a lot of your car parks will will have uh, barriers that people have to. Some do. So some are surface sites, as you can imagine, that are, are what you call the pan display site. So they are patrolled, uh, and the barriered sites they're still patrolled, but as you say, yes, barriers on the front. Okay. So those barrier sites. Yes. Um, do d disabled drivers have to pay? Yeah. Yeah. So they do have to pay. Yes, they do have to pay. They're still patrolled because. The numbers that I gave you in front are not for non-payment. These are for people who have not displayed uh, a blue badge whilst parking in one of those spaces. Um, so these are manually contravention notices that have been spotted by an individual patrolling rather than... Um, so one of our sites in Glasgow is an AMPR site. Uh, as Tony said, it's technology but it can't monitor every space. So we patrol those for this sort of abuse. The cameras are normally for non-payment. Oh, okay. Um, so, so just at those barrier sites, so pe the disabled people um, have to pay the same as everyone else. Um, and you as a company, 
uh, enforce, uh, take enforcement action if non-disabled drivers are using disabled spaces? Absolutely. And um, one, one, one of the things too, how we really approach this was we've spent a lot of time as a business. We were pretty much founder members with DMUK's Disabled Parking Accreditation. Um, so we spent a lot of time taking consultation from Helen Dolphin, MBU leads that, and also People's Parking. We hold 15 accreditations across, across Scotland. Um, and they gave us a lot of advice into how to approach this with regards to enforcement, friendly enforcement, charging of disabled customers. And, and one of the things that came paramount from this is, and the counsel we got from Helen herself was, it wasn't about the charging or non-charging of a disabled customer. It was more about the enforcement of the spaces and the right facilities. So we spent a lot of time working with them. They came in, um, they came to all of our frontline conferences, spoke to the actual frontline guys who patrol about how to enforce, why they're enforcing. Um, so most of our route we took on this approach was from a, a third party, what we call expert in this. Is there, is there um, does I hear what you're saying about your own company, and that's, that, that sounds fine. I described at the, at the last session um, another quite big company, which uh, in my experience, I didn't name them, I won't name them today, but in my experience uh, did, does not uh, take enforcement action, or doesn't appear to because their disabled spaces are routinely abused. Is there a, an industry body in Scotland that monitors this? The BPA uh, that, that are accredited to all large, uh, I would call professional parking operators, you should be a member of the you know, approved operator scheme in the BPA. They should give guidance and legislation. I think when it comes to disabled parking, yes, there is legislation on it, but it's also the way you approach it. So. Um, if you, if, if you imagine when we ask people to issue a, a penalty charge of any description, it's always quite an emotive thing for someone to do because it can be confrontational, it can be quite difficult. Um, but I think as a business what we did was we tried to challenge um, the guys issuing them with a disabled approach after learning why they're issuing the ticket. Um, so they follow, I, I mean, it's more of a, a company guideline. There are some legislation rules around it. How, if they have to enforce or not, it's down to the individual company. Some don't charge. Okay, just one final question, Convener. Um, do, I and mean, it applies to both of you really, do you display notices in your car parks saying that enforcement action will be taken uh, against people who abuse these spaces? For, from our perspective, yes. Um, and actually one of the um, uh, one of the additional benefits of the, the technology rollout is that the, the, there's a signage refresh as, as part of that. So, um, uh, so yes, yeah, so, I mean, we, um, as, as, as a business, absolutely want to distinguish ourselves uh, on, on customer service. So that's about making sure that our car parks offer a full re range or suite of um, uh, uh, opportunities for our customers. So whether that's um, clearly marked um, disabled base, which are, are 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 close to the front of the store and have a flat um, uh, flat short access to to the front of the store. To you know, we offer parent and child parking, which again is clearly marked. Um, in fact, we're in the process of um, trialling uh, mum to be parking um, as 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 well. So it's 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 a, it's an area that's constantly innovating as as we continue to speak to our customers about what they they want and expect to make them um, have a fantastic shopping trip. Okay. Can I just check, I'll bring in a wee second, Elena, can, yes. can I just check how much money is raised from enforcement? Tell me what enforcement means, I suppose, is what I'm saying. So what's the level of fines? How is it collected? How is it escalated? Where does the money go, I suppose? is Just to get a context to that before we move on to the next section of questioning. Mr Bounds, could you maybe... So over the last two years, we've issued 981 penalty charge notice for pub, uh, disabled by abuse. Um, that charge is £100. It's £50 if paid within 14 days. Um, that revenue goes back into the company. OK. Is that to subsidise... Our cost recovery for the patrolling? Or the yes, I mean, I mean, it, it's, that's not, I mean, you can imagine the patrolling and then the signage alone. I mean, we spent over £200,000 worth of signage probably three years ago when we reached all our terms and conditions and signage boards. In relation to also the question before, all of our car parks are fully signed for disabled parking 
by abuse and clearly state what the charge will be if you do use it. Um, so yes, the cost really goes back into the business to operating more patrols, more signage. There's maybe a debate for another day about what should happen to that money given the fact that I'm sure your company does make a significant, well I hope it makes a significant profit actually. <laughs> but, um, you know, so that's maybe a debate for another day but just put on record maybe there's queries there about how that money could in theory be used. Um, but it's not, that's not what we're exploring today. But thank you for, for yep. letting, letting us know that, Mr. McElroy. Yeah, so um, so it's a £70 charge in, in Tesco. That's reduced to £42 if paid within uh, within 14 days. Um, all of it is done. Uh, all of the uh, revenue that's generated through that is absolutely reinvested in parking enforcement across our, uh, across our store estate. Um, we certainly don't... Um, uh, generate enough uh, revenue through fines to uh, to to recover the cost of you know refreshing the uh, bay markings, refreshing the signage, employing marshals and and, and cameras and so <coughs> forth. Um, and and at the moment, the the revenue that's been raised is being reinvested in in technology and the tech rollout that will hopefully see that um, uh, see enforcement rates go up. And aligned to that, actually, um, uh, convener, as, as enforcement rates go up, hopefully you would have a diminishing return. So you would hopefully actually be generating less money um, as, as people saw um, uh, a higher degree of, of, of enforcement taking place. So, so there's, there's probably less money involved than... Than, than maybe it's. And as I say, that's that's good to put on the record. It's also a debate for another day. It's not particularly what we're looking at just now, but it's important to understand how those revenues are, are, are used. So thank you for that. Elaine Smith, you wanted to come in? Thanks, Convener. Yes, it's, it's just a short follow up to uh, this line of question. And obviously, the, the act that we're looking at, um, the, the ethos there would be to make sure as much as possible that uh, disabled parking spaces are left free for people who are entitled to use them with. Uh, disabilities with blue badges. However, if the people who are entitled to use them happen to make a mistake, so for example, the badge is turned upside down or the badge falls off onto the seat, um, is that something that you take into consideration? If you've is issued a notice, would you then uh, cancel that notice if the person could send you a copy, for example, of their blue badge? Um. Mr. Burns. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the answer to the question is we review every case for every penalty charge notice um, if there is an appeal. So there is an appeal process for all notices through Poplar, which is an independent body. Um, but also, we do take a common sense approach. Um, you can imagine if someone parks in a disabled base and they haven't got their blue badge, and the difficulty is if they're evidently disabled, one of our colleagues is not going to say, "Well, you're going to get a ticket." There's that approach, but there's also if someone generally, if it falls off, or it's, you certainly wouldn't get one for having it upside down. But if there was an appeal um, and someone sent a photograph in, you know, normally we would turn around and go, hmm, that's obviously common sense. What we're looking for is blatant abuse. You know, one of the ones we challenge the most in this, the most difficult position is airports, where you have disabled parking at airports is one of our biggest challenges. 27% of all our tickets are at airports because people just want to drop off and pick up. Um, so that's probably our highest enforcement of disabled parking. But every appeal for every ticket whether it's disabled or not goes through an appeal process so yes okay thanks um, maybe i could put the same question to mr McElroy, particularly because um in my line of work i have dealt with many cases of disabled drivers who have actually had their, their badge upside down and have been issued in particularly in tesco car parks who have then been issued with notices and it's been a bit of a, a fight as a, as the msp to try and, and get that overturned for them yeah, and um, so so the, so there is a, the, there is absolutely an, uh, absolutely a, a, an appeals mechanism and appeals process there, and obviously if somebody could prove that they were a blue badge holder and um, had had been issued a, a fine in, in error, a ticket in error, then um, we would we would be able to to deal with that. Um, I think what the what the the technology that is is being introduced um, uh, across our estate um, enables us to do is to take out some of the the third party um, operatives who are, are frankly incentivized not on customer service but they're incentivized on the volume of tickets that they issue 
and put the power to enforce disabled parking in the hands of our colleagues who are trained to Tesco standard of customer services. So as a business, we want great customer service and we want to enforce um, uh, disabled parking basins. It's about striking the right balance. And our view is that actually that's best done by Tesco people um, rather than the third party. So we, we're, on, we're on that trajectory. OK, thanks. Could I just also convene and ask Mr Bounds about the BPA? You mentioned the BPA earlier. Um, does that cover Scotland? And is it, if, it, if it does, is it more about the companies rather than the customer? Um, I don't actually know the coverage of the BPA because obviously they represent themselves and we're a member of those. But the BPA is the, is the governing body of all professional parking and they set the legislation to be. So, for example, to issue a penalty charge notice of any description you need dvla access to be able to get keeper information if you're not a member of the approved operator scheme of that you can't have that access so it's um their coverage in scotland i don't know who's a member here in the in the bpa um, but we are and that's the governing body okay thank you yeah, maybe just to put on the record that we did invite the bpa to today's evidence session but they were unable to make it they didn't Decline because they didn't want to attend, but they were unable to make it for today's evidence session. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Gentlemen, you've both talked about the accessibility, uh, ensuring that your disabled parking bays are in locations uh, within your car park or within your outside your store uh, to make it easy for individuals who have a disability uh, to, to use your facilities. Now, uh, Mr McElroy, in, in stores like your own, you try and encourage people to come in and you've, you've done lots of things within the stores to, to do that as well, to make it more disabled access and, uh, and, and progress. Uh, but, but my question would be about repeat offenders. Uh, have, have either of you looked at the, how you're going to tackle individuals who uh, are repeat offenders and, and how the best way to manage that process? Uh, because that continues to be an issue uh, across both of your sectors. I yeah, I think um, I think from our perspective, um, I think you know that there, there are that there, there are a hard core of repeat offenders who I, su I suspect are not uniquely repeat offenders in Tesco. I suspect they're repeat offenders regardless of of, of where they're parking, whether that's on street, off street, or or, or so forth. Um, I think we are increasingly um, uh, so as. The, one of the things that we can capture um, through uh, through a rollout of, of handheld technology is it's much easier to to identify patterns of uh, patterns of, of, of behaviour um, from frankly antisocial drivers antisocial antisocial parking um, in terms of um, uh, so, so in, in a very very targeted way. Um, I think we're in a place where increasingly we can build that evidence base around those those repeat offenders. Um, in terms of the, you, you mentioned the, the design um, of of the of the car parks. Um, I mean, just to say that there is a huge amount of effort goes into thinking about the design of our car parks. So, for example, um, we will try and ensure that um, uh, and try and ensure that cash machines, for example are not overly close to the disabled parking base that in a way that would incentivize somebody to just think I'm going to nip in and take out some cash machines. So we'll have a cash machine that would be obviously accessible for our, uh, our disabled customers, our disabled colleagues, um, but in the whole, you know, extremely choiceful in terms of how we lay out the car park and make it as accessible as possible for, um, for our, our, our disabled customers um, and our disabled colleagues as well. Um, you can come on to uh, that separately, but you, uh, you know, as a as a large uh, or the largest private sector employer in Scotland, we um, are, are fundamentally committed to having that diversity in our employment base as well. That um, and you know, we we are an active recruiter of um, colleagues with with disabilities. And they feed into that whole process as well as trying to advise. You, how, how to manage the whole process about the parking uh, and the, the way that that whole operation uh, works from from beginning because some of your stores are open 24 hours a day yep. uh, uh, and there will be there will be peak times uh, when things happen uh, and when bays are are being used uh, or when individuals require more support and assistance yeah I think that I think that's right so um, you know in terms of our business mission um, of serving Scotland's shoppers um, 
a little better every day. Um, uh, we want to... Um, other supermarket <laughs> chains are available, um, as are small corner shops. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think, settings, yes. I think to, 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 my, to my mind, what that means is that ensuring disabled customers um, can access the car park, um, you know, and it's a, it's a clearly identified bay in the car park is a, uh, is, is a safe and secure environment for them to park. As I say, there's, there's level access um, uh, in, to, to, the, to the front of the store. And then customers who have specific support needs in our store have access to them. So, for example, in the last year, we've purchased around a thousand specialist trolleys for disabled children um, uh, in order to help make the shopping trip for parents who have who have uh, children with specialist needs just a, 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 a little bit a little bit easier. Um, through to the fact that you know, we've got our, our training rollout for colleagues in disability awareness, helping them uh, helping our colleagues. Um, uh, understand um, perhaps the specialist needs of, of disabled um, disabled customers. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Mr. Bounds, not um, so. Is it, I thought is it, is it Bounds or Bones? Bones. 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 My, I apologise. No, uh, so uh, Duncan. Yes, that's <laughs> easier. Um, in terms, I think the original question was in was, was in was, was in relation to um, repeat offenders. Of, that may be the wrong expression, but those who persistently park in disabled bays. You wouldn't be able to track any of that within your company. And if your company does have a tagline, feel free to put it on the record <laughs> as well. A bit of marketing. I, I think the, t the challenge with repeat offenders, and we do have data, so, so we do monitor all the data from every time a ticket is issued, we know to who. This is getting a lot more sophisticated, and something we can be a lot cleverer about, especially if we share between businesses who these repeat offenders are. And we do get to the point where we issue a banning notice. Now you can imagine that that is a point where we inform the client because of your repeat offender, you you are you know you're banned from this site. Enforcing that is very difficult. You know it's 24 hour day car park. How will you know if this person's in or out? They could use a different vehicle. It is very difficult, but we do take steps to say that you are now banned from this car park. Um, so we do try and do that, but it, it it's it can be deemed as very difficult to enforce who has been banned. Um, but that's the answer to that question. With okay. Opportunity to put, put that on the record, uh, Andy Whiteman. Thanks, convener. Um, the, the thrust of this legislation is to create enforceable parking places for disabled people, which are then policeable by by public authorities. We've had quite a bit of evidence from public authorities expressing their frustration at their inability to reach agreements with private operators and off off street um, sites with this regard. Do you have any views as to why that might be? We have no record of any approach from a local authority to patrol any of our car parks. We, we've checked with, going back the last two years, with anybody of our management team in Scotland. So if there has, we have no record of that. I mean, we patrol anyway and enforce, and you can see by the data we do enforce. Um, this, this isn't to do with the powers of local authorities to patrol. This is the, to do with bringing the disabled parking places that you provide within the enforceability of local authorities as opposed to being enforceable by civil action in the private sector. Uh, have you had any approaches from any local authorities across Scotland? Not when I spoke to my team in Scotland, no. And we, we have nothing on record of that now. I'm sure yeah. that is accurate. It would, it would be very, very helpful for us if you were able to interrogate that a bit further. There's absolutely a discussion. If you've got anything, we're absolutely yeah. happy to have discussions. And okay, well, that, that's that fascinating help. because local authorities are under a duty at least every year, two years, to attempt to create right, okay. these enforceable place. Okay. Mr. Marco, do you want to comment? Um, only, only to, I, I don't think, um, given, of, given the volume of stores, and I think we touch every single local authority, I'm not sure I could be quite as absolutist in terms of levels of, uh, levels of contact. What I would uh, suspect, however, is that the local authorities um, will, will adopt a kind of risk assessment um, uh, as to uh, whether or not businesses within their communities are um, enforcing disabled bays and I would certainly like to think that any local government official who or, or any member of Police Scotland who was approaching one of our stores would quite quickly see that you know every store has got a parking plan and every store has got um, a, an enforcement plan for the for its disabled parking bays so um, 
uh, I, I suspect that's that's the approach that that local government take, but obviously I couldn't speak on their, their but, behalf. But, but to clarify, I mean, Police Scotland, the local authorities don't have any powers to do that on, on private land. That's the whole point of this legislation is to enable them to, um, or is to mandate them indeed to try and bring disabled spaces into the statutorily enforceable regime rather than the private civil law enforceable um, uh, regime. Um, I mean, is your argument basically that for, from your organisations, and there are many, many more private operators out there, there's GP clinics and all the rest of it. From your point of view, there would be no need for that? I, I, think, I think from my perspective, um, I would say, you know, look at, look at the evidence of what, what Tesco is doing, and we want to set ourselves apart from our competitors by offering great service for our customers. So we want customers to, to choose Tesco. And therefore, um, if for our customers, um, having access to the car park and access to a disabled parking bay is, or is an important part of their shopping trip, then we want them to choose Tesco for exactly those reasons. So the fact that it becomes a competitive uh, element amongst retailers is probably, quite a, is, is probably quite a good thing, I think, for, um, for disabled motorists. Oh, that's not the evidence we've heard from disabled interests that it should be left to the market and competition. I mean, they, it's about it's about having the right and the expectation that there is availability of disabled parking places and that they are properly enforceable wherever anyone chooses to go. They should get they should get that at Tesco. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, just a little further. Yeah, I appreciate both of you will understand and will be giving evidence based on the experience for, for, for both your companies. Um, now, Mr Bones, you, you have pain display kind of uh, surface sites rather than the kind of in the sky ba ba barrier sites or, or what have you. I, I could see a, a common sense approach that a, a TRO by a local authority could, could bring disabled bays uh, in line with every other disabled bay in, in a town, village, or city, and that local authority wardens could 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 enforce that. And whether there was a a financial accommodation between your company and the local authority, I have no idea. But that would seem to be common sense—a dangerous thing in politics. But that would seem to be a common sense approach. Um, and Mr. McElroy, like, likewise, I can think, depending on the Tesco store, and I think of my own constituency, I can think of one large Twitter or Tesco store that kind of sits away from everywhere else. So it might not appear common sense to have local authority wardens, uh, you know, patrolling the bees at that store. But I can think of another one in a, in a different urban setting where, you know, you'd like to see the local authority wardens out and about anyway. And given the fact that there are statutory duties in local authorities to be approaching your companies every couple of years, would it not be reasonable whether or not uh, you put your base over to be enforced by the local authority or not, that at least a partnership agreement should be struck by each local authority and your companies? If I answer that, I mean, we do actually across the country already have partnerships with local authorities. So some of our um, contracts we have with uh, St Albans, with Manchester, um, are already our all our penalty charge notice are served by the local authority under a TRO. So depending on the mechanics of the actual agreement that we work under, so it is possible when we do do that, um, whether that would make enforcement or not better, because you know we you know we track and actually say our own rates actually normally percentage-wise, are better than the local authorities. I think it's because of our closer manpower and they are on-site all the time rather than patrolling eight or nine sites. Um, but we do do that under TROs with some councils already. Any examples in Scotland? Or no, not, not in Scotland. It does, I mean, this, this is a yeah. question for local authorities yeah. rather than, than your yeah. company, but it does seem a little bit odd given yeah. the statutory duty to approach each yeah. of your sites every two years on local authorities that that, that, that hasn't been progressing. Mm -hmm. Mr. McElroy, what's your experience? I, I think the I think the point I would make um, on local authority uh, local authority enforcement is is similar to um, drawing on our experience where we've had third party um, uh, operators patrolling our car park. Uh, you know the reason why we've moved away from having third parties 
patrolling our car park is so as we can set the standard in what great service looks like. We can set the standard in um, how we work with our customers to enforce those, those bays. So, um, so in the same as a way as a private operator um, patrolling our car park, which still happens um, in Tesco at the moment, but um, uh, that private operator, uh, probably it would be the same with local authority. Moving, we, we want to move away from that, bring it in-house and have Tesco set the standard for what great service looks like. I mean, I, mean, I suppose the case could be, Mr McElroy, and it's not a reflection on Tesco, but uh, the law of the land should set the standard for what great service looks like, and that was the whole point of, of, of this particular act. Now, if, if, if any private company with, with their own land can go beyond that and provide an even better service, then fantastic. I, I suppose the point that I'm making is that given their statutory duties and local authorities to approach companies every couple of years, does, does Tesco have any recollection of being approached by by a local authority? I think Dundee have tried quite hard. I, I'm, I'm assuming there's Tesco's in, in, in Dundee. Dundee have tried quite hard. Um, so what's the experience of Tesco in relation to how they've had that discussion with uh, local authorities in Scotland? Um, I wouldn't be able to comment specifically on any local... I'm not, I'm not aware specifically of um, individual local authority um, lo local authority agreements or local authority conversations that we've had. Um, but, I, you know, we, we deal with local government officers um, in our stores probably on a near daily basis from, you know, licensing standards officers through to, um, you know, community work. And so I, I think actually our store in Aloha even shares a car park with the council office. You know, I think um, we, we, the nature of our business is such that we have a, a, a near daily relationship with, with local government. And I um, would be absolutely confident that a local government officer approaching one of our stores would, would quite quickly see that you know, every store has a parking plan, is, uh, every store manager is committed to offering our customers a, a great safe place to park. Got local authorities coming to our committee, I think it's next week, along with Police Scotland, to talk about enforcement and the statutory duties there. And just, just put on the record again, we are scrutinising, this is post-legislative scrutiny. If there are ways to improve the legislation, which, which means there's a better way of formalising the relationship between private companies, private land, and what is the law of the land, uh, local authorities with their statutory duties, then, then by all means let's look at that. But we have had some evidence uh, saying that the, the, the take up from uh, uh, pri you know, large private companies has been pretty poor. But from what I'm hearing today, maybe the proactive approach of local authorities may not be all it should be either. Is there any partnership agreement? Mr Bones has helpfully said there is no partnership agreement in Scotland that he's aware of for his company. Is there any partnership agreement in Scotland that Tesco's entered into with local authorities? Not, not, that, not that I'm aware of. Um, not that I'm aware of, but it, certainly in a formal sense. But like I say, we would have a, 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 sure. a, a regular relationship with, with local government at all, at, at all levels. OK, and maybe there's informal uh, discussions yeah. there and, and, and nothing formal has been created. Elaine Smith, you wanted to follow up? And Thanks, Convener. Yes, if you don't mind, because um, I think one of the main reasons for perhaps inviting you here today was to explore um, how you feel about the, 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 the um, enforceable parking bays in, in your areas. So we'll leave that to one side for the moment, because I think that has, has been explored by the Convener and others. But the other side of that is, how do you then enforce your own situations? Now, I can understand with barrier parking, Mr Bones, that that would be easier to enforce. But if we look at something like Tesco, if you give notices or try to charge customers for parking in disabled base when they were not meant to be parking, what's to stop them just ignoring it, given it's contract law? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, I, I, I think... Potentially, um, there there is a there is an issue with um, you know repeat uh, belligerent offenders. Um, I, I think you tend to find though that with with the, the the nature of blue badges, there's far less ambiguity um, uh, than um, there is the, the issues that we would have perhaps with people overstaying a, a three hour time limit in one of our car parks. So. Um, somebody could overstay in one of our car parks um, for perfectly legitimate reasons, um, and and you know, you would have a conversation with the customer about that and be able to um, be able to to, to fix that. Um, there's less ambiguity with the, with the blue badge, and therefore um, 
uh, the, you know, the conversation is uh, with the customer is. Can I just clarify, convener, that if someone parks in a disabled bay, they're sent a notice by one of your operators at the moment that are, that are enforcing these situations for you in your car parks, and they simply bin that because they happen to know that it's contract law and they happen to know that it's highly unlikely that you're going to pursue them all the way to court. Would it not be better for you and your customers, particularly your disabled customers, to consider the enforcement as provided by the councils and by the law rather than by contract law? I think so. Histor historically, I think that may have been the case. I think as we move forward, um, I'm quite happy to talk you through or show you the, the, the handheld equipment that colleagues have got. Um, but the evidence that that creates is such that if somebody is a significant repeat offender, then there is a far greater volume of evidence that would mean that we would be in a position to pursue pursue that, that prosecution. You need to pursue this, but how would you pursue it? How? Well, huh. so would you would you then take that case to court under contract law? Is that what you would do? I, I think increasingly we would have the evidence. We would have the evidence to to do that. I'm not a lawyer, so I couldn't specifically go into the the detail of 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 how we would pursue that prosecution. But um, what we can do with the technology is capture um, in a far better um, uh, way now people who are abusing disabled base. So. For example, historically, um, the the warden would literally walk up, issue a ticket, and move on to move on to the next job. What we've got now is the power in order to firstly give our colleagues um, uh, the the enforcement, um, but secondly to build that body of evidence so as we can challenge repeat offenders in a far more targeted way. But and I'm sorry to keep on about this, but the bottom line, I suppose, as you talked about your customers, you've then got a customer there who may say to your colleagues. <laughs> Well, I'm parking here because I'm going into your store to spend £100 in my weekly shopping. And if you don't like that, then I'm going to take my custom elsewhere. And that may put your colleagues in a difficult position. But if you were to actually go down the line of local authority enforcing for you, then it would take that, that away from you. And it would then also take it away from the, from the fact that you are only relying on contract law. And unless you have a barrier, as Mr Bones has in some of his car parks, then you would find it rather difficult to prove that the person actually saw it was a disabled space, etc., when, when they came into your car park. And that's the problem that you would have, and that is the reason why um, I think that you may... Well, it's up to yourself, of course, but <coughs> I suppose we would be asking you whether or not you would be considering the, the enforcement option through the local authorities, through this legislation, instead of relying on what is basically contract law and you having to prove that the person broke some kind of contract with you? I think, um, I think on, on, well, so firstly, I think there would be no ambiguity for any of our customers about whether or not they were parking in a disabled bay. They're, you know, they're clearly marked, clear signage. Um, and and you know, it's, it's quite obvious that that's the purpose of, 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 of that bay. Um, the second point I'd make is on, on our colleagues um, is, I think our colleagues are, are, are perfectly well equipped to have that difficult conversation with the customers because in exactly the same way as I think our customers are appalled by people who are parking in the disabled base when they shouldn't, our customer, our, our colleagues are absolutely appalled by that antisocial, antisocial behaviour because they know themselves that it's potentially depriving a, a, a disabled motorist who needs that space to access that space. So, so this, is a, this, is a, this is a customer service led initiative within Tesco. It's, it's, not, it's not a commercial thing. It's, it's about offering our customers great service because that's the point of differentiation for us. Can we just, uh, Mr. Bones, not bring you back in something because this focus, I think, more on the kind of supermarket sector at the moment. I think it's a really worthwhile line of questioning that Lane Smith's exploring. Do you have any information, Mr. McElroy, on how many fines go unpaid? Um, on dis uh, on disabled bays, yeah. um, it's re it's it's reasonably low compared to um, when it's uh, overstays. So overstays, I think there are far th th there's a far broader spectrum of reasons why somebody might might overstay. Um, um, as I say, with with blue badge, um, it's uh, it's th this this kind of fewer. It's less it's less ambiguous. You've either you've either 
you know, got a blue badge or, or, or you don't. Information, and you're, you're talking in general terms, mm. if the information exists, it would be quite helpful for the committee to, to, to get that. And that, that, that's not targeting Tesco, you just happen to be the, the supermarket chain who are kind of turn up and give evidence to the committee uh, today. So, so, so we, th we thank you for that. I, I can understand why a, a large commercial retailer would want to keep a degree of control over the customer service it provides to its patrons using its car parks and what those standards look like. I get all that. But if there's a way of squaring the circle, which is via a new form of TRO or whatever, that without losing flexibility that other supermarkets and others could have, if those could be enforced under the law of the land in partnership with local authorities, to give, a, to give at least a minimum standard, that would surely be a good thing. Is that something you think Tesco will be willing to explore with local authorities across Scotland, or indeed explore in terms of the legislation as passed to see if it has to be tweaked or amended to make that, to give the assurances that perhaps your sector needs Mr McElroy to, to sign up to some of this stuff? Yeah, I mean, in terms of what, in terms of what happens next, I think um, actually the opportunity is... Um, uh, so looking at it through the prism of of you know, what Tesco does um, in enforcement and what t Tesco does in, in customer service, um, actually I think in terms of what happens next from from our perspective is very much about um, that public awareness of the, un the the unacceptability of parking in a bay that is identified as being for a disabled motorist um, when you're not a disabled motorist. So it's it's about um, it's about changing the behaviours of those who are in, inclined, for whatever reason, to park in a disabled to park in a disabled bay. As a business, we'll continue to enforce them absolutely to the best of our ability, and we're undergoing a step change in how in how we do that. But I think if the committee is thinking, well, where do we go next in terms of the legislation? Um, my steer would be, you know, let's reinforce the social unacceptability of of um, of, of parking in a disabled bay because that then reinforces the enforcement mechanisms that, that we've got as a business and the actions that we're taking in order to ensure that people don't park in disabled bays when, so when they're the trying to tease out not just the social unacceptable aspect of it but the consistency of approach across the country in the public highway and on private land of which supermarkets and and uh, and car park operators are significant players. Uh, one way of doing that could ultimately be compulsion in relation to this, and that was shied away with. It's about every couple of years asking local authorities to um, approach uh, private sites to see if a TRO can be developed to bring that level of enforcement and consistency in. I suppose what I'm saying, Mr McElroy, is my last punt at this, right? Uh, rather than saying Tesco, Asda, Morrison's, whoever, rather than say we've got corporate policies and we'll tell you how wonderful it is, and it might or might not be, I have no idea. There has to be a consistency and minimum standard uh, and equity for those with blue badges right across the country. And that surely has to be in partnership between local authorities and the private sector. It's clearly not happening just now. That's not to say there might not be good practice out there. And mm -hmm. Mr. McElroy, you're, you're hinting that that might look like Mr. Bones is doing likewise. But would you be open-minded to working in partnership with local authorities to see how we can improve the legislation <laughs> to have a, form, a more formal partnership rather than finding supermarkets or private car park operators who are the they say the cowboys in the sector don't quite mm. mean that way, who are the mm. poorly performing ones mm. and have to bring in a degree of compulsion to everyone to get that consistently. Surely new models of working and Tesco would like to think we'd open that and NCP would open to that. So any comments on that before I bring in Mr Whiteman, who knows to follow up on some of this as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, as I say, we work with local government across you know, a huge number of areas that, that, that we operate whether that would be to reach a kind of formal agreement or, or informal agreement, then we would always be happy to have that conversation um, uh, to, to make sure that we are you know, working in partnership with, with, with local government. Um, I think you know, our ambition would always be to set the standard um, for customer service. So as long as, no, uh, as, long as nothing um, happened that 
you know, stopped our ability to be setting the standard, then you know, we would always be happy to have that, that conversation. Okay, I think I almost got you there, Mr. Mac- Mr. McElroy, but not quite. I think we're trying to set the, set the standard for disability rights in Scotland. And if Tesco and others want to go beyond that, then fantastic. But there has to be a partnership with local authorities which are setting the standard for disability rights in Scotland in the first instance, separate from corporate and commercial concerns. So I'm glad we got there a little bit about how we can maybe take some of that forward. Uh, Mr Bones? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to have the discussion. I mean, as I said, we already work with um, Disabled Motor in UK. We already work with People's Park in DPA. We have local authority joint ventures and TROs already existing as some of ours. Mm-hmm. Any more? Dis- I mean, we're having discussions now with the local authorities about whole parking joint ventures. So this is just another discussion okay. to have. So absolutely happy to have those discussions. Really helpful. Uh, Mr Whiteman, you wanted to follow up on some? Yes, I just wanted to follow up briefly on my previous questions. And that's just for the record, given that Glasgow and Edinburgh have both confirmed to us that no TROs have been issued since this Act came into force, and you've hinted that you've had no discussions with them on this. Could you supply in writing to the committee any record of correspondence you've had with local authorities about the duties under this Act that would help us in scrutinising? We could give you a response of nil response, but I mean, I've, I've spoken to over the last week all of the last three senior managers who've run the Scottish portfolio and and apart from one telephone conversation I think it was in 2009 that someone said we had a conversation to arrange a meeting but it never happened that's that's all so yeah we can respond so we haven't had that contact so. that, that would be helpful because on the face of it there's some contradiction between what local authorities are saying they've done under the act in terms of trying to secure enforceable yeah. bays and you're basically yeah. saying yeah. You've, you've, you've heard nothing yeah. so it would help if you could, and Mr. Yeah. McElroy, likewise, I, I, I can try and bring some clarity to that okay. for you. Um, the, the caveat simply being the volume of sites that we operate um, yes. means that I wouldn't be able to capture local conversations that have 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 taken place. So from no, a, we're from, look, a, we're looking, from the centre, then I can I can try and capture that. We're, we're looking specifically at any approaches you've had from local authorities about their powers under the Act, mm. no other approaches on anything else. Yeah, and, and where that's happened within our head office, I'll be able to capture that for you. Mm. Where that's happened in um, you know, a very localised um, environment, you know, Fort William, to pick a store out of thin air, um, uh, you know, that, that's a bit trickier to capture some of that. Fair enough. We will do what we can. And if I, just say, I think the challenge with this, it looks historically, is it's the point of contact. So you can imagine today's forum was pointed at, we picked this straight up and said, absolutely happy to come. And it proves if it's going to the right place, if you're trying to, as I've probably just told you this, contact lots and lots of local people, do they know what to do with it? Are they aware of it? Does it go anywhere? So I think actually from a, from a national level, I think it's easy to actually point these in proper conversations. Okay, Elaine Smith, let follow up. Thank you, convener. I just wanted to ask Mr McElroy, um, is it difficult, Mr McElroy, to email all your store managers and inquire as to whether or not the local authority has approached them under the duties that they have under this Act? Is that something that, that you wouldn't be able to do? I could do it, but whether they would have captured any conversations um, that may have taken over the last couple of years in writing or so forth is... Um, you, 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 the, the, the process of asking um, colleagues is is, is, can, is, is, is straightforward. Um, it's capturing the data in a in a sense that's meaningful for the committee. I think is is where I would where I would see a bit of a challenge. Well, I think we'd be grateful if you could um, perhaps try because if your stores received email approaches or letters from local councils asking, then it would be of interest to us to try and find that out and the people who would know whether they had been approached by the local authority would presumably be your store managers and I'm conscious that you're the only um, <laughs> store here that we're mm-hmm. asking this of but it may be something that we want to ask anyway of, of other supermarket operators um, you know, not just putting you on the spot but you happen to be here with us today yeah. and I think it's something that we'd be I'm, interested I'm, in trying to find out and I'm and, and I'm you know more than happy to try and harness what information and data I can I can get for you. Um, I'm just um, think, thinking through how our colleagues in store may or may not have captured that, particularly if it was um, a less formalised conversation or a less formal a- agreement that was the output of that. Then that will be slightly trickier. But I will 
committed to doing what I can to, to, to help. OK, we're shortly going to finish this evidence session. Any other member want to come in? I would like clarification. Of yes, of course. Thanks very much. Convener, just if we're shortly finishing. Um, Mr Bones, I think I'm right in saying that, that you mentioned at the beginning that um, people can make an independent appeal to Poplar. But my understanding was that Poplar only operated in England and Wales. Am I right? Yes, but they can also... So that was an example of how they can appeal, but they can also appeal to us. So we take uh -huh. any common sense approach will be they will, they will write to us in the first instance. If it's English, we'll refer them to Poplar, but we'll make it always make a case by case decision. But I can just clarify that if you're in Scotland, then you cannot appeal to Poplar because no. that Poplar doesn't cover Scotland. No. Thank you. I wanted to just clarify yes. that for the record. Okay, and just before we close uh, today's evidence session, um, I think it's a uh, reasonable um, to say that it's a two-way process. This whole thing. Um, uh, Mr. Bowens, Mr. Macro, you've come in as as large scale representatives within uh, the private sector to see what your experiences are in trying to improve uh, uh, disability access uh, in in towns and cities and the services you provide uh, uh, across Scotland. Local authorities will be in next week to see what what, what they are doing. I'm conscious that that exchange we had, with Mr. McElroy, in relation to store managers, would have captured that information. Perhaps the guidance has been local authorities should be making. <laughs> Uh, direct representations to the corporate head of an organisation rather than a, a store manager who's a thousand and one other things to do and that should link in with what the corporate policy is for, for companies. It's a two-way process and we have to get the guidance right, we have to get the legislation right and we have to make sure there's an acceptable minimum standard there even if uh, companies are asserting and can demonstrate good practice in the area we have to ensure a consistency and quality of service for everyone who's disabled in Scotland, whether it's the public highway or otherwise. So thank you very much for, for coming along. We have a few minutes left. If there's anything else you want to put on the record, uh, you've got that opportunity now. If you want to take take that opportunity. Um, it's simply um, uh, convenient to say that um, I've briefly touched on, I think, to my mind, the next phase of this is reinforcing um, to the general public that um, you know parking in a disabled bay when you're not entitled to is is unacceptable, and the you know, businesses, councils, whomever are proactively taking action to to deal with that. But I think you know, we do need uh, some kind of public information campaign, some kind of targeted campaign, whether that's one for ministers, whether that's one for Police Scotland, who I think you said you're seeing next week. Um, you know, if if there was some kind of campaign al along those lines in and around reinforcing those messages of socially unacceptable um, parking, then you know, we would absolutely be in a position to get behind that. Okay, that's very helpful, uh, Mr. Bones. I, I, I think just just for this, I think we you know we're quite proud of what we've done so far with you know the work we've put into disabled parking, but as I said, any conversations with local authorities, you know, as we we're already doing in in other parts of the country absolutely happy to have because at the end of the day it's it's a it's, it's this is never about revenue generation this is about doing the right thing with disabled parking so anything can make it better happy to have those conversations okay uh, can i thank both of you gentlemen again for your, your time here this morning that ends agenda item two and we now move into private session i suspend thanks